Hello there and welcome to another video. My name is Riley and today we're going to be taking a look at NEO, the smart economy on the blockchain. Now before I get into the video, I want to preface it by saying that I'm not a financial advisor and this is just for education. In this video, today we're going to be looking at what is NEO, how does it work, the use cases of it, the features of it, why is it useful, the team of the community behind it, where you buy and store it, the th my thoughts on the future, and a little bit of technical analysis at the end. So, without further ado, let's get into it, shall we? I forgot to mention too, if you haven't seen any of my videos before, I'll put timestamps in the description box next to each of these headings, so if you only want to see a specific part of the video, you can just go there and click on that part of the video. So to start off, what is NEO? Well, NEO is an open source blockchain platform which is designed um, to create a distributed network for the smart economy. And a smart economy, economy by definition is an online exchange of physical assets for digital assets. NEO was founded as Anshares in 2014 by Da Hongfei and Eric Zhang, I think that's how you pronounce it. And in 2017 it was rebranded as NEO. The NEO smart economy, economy, oh my god, that's the second time, uh, how they define it is digital assets plus a digital identity plus a digital uh, plus smart contracts, sorry. In terms of the coins with NEO, we currently have 50 million in supply, which were distributed during an ICO, and the total supply is 100 million. The block time for NEO is quite quick, on average it's about 20 seconds, but it does vary a couple of seconds either way. So how does it work? Well, first I want to talk about Delegated Byzantine Fault Tolerance, or DBFT. And you see, because NEO does not use proof of work or proof of stake, like many other cryptocurrencies, it uses this DBFT. And this is, de uh, this is derived from the Byzantine Generals problem. And for those who don't know, this was the problematic nature of achieving consensus in a distributed system with suboptimal communication between agents who did not necessarily trust each other. And what do I mean by that? So back in the old days when the Byzantine army was around, about I think it was about a thousand years ago, they would have all these generals in different places who didn't have effective means of communication and didn't necessarily trust each other. So this made it hard in order, uh, in hard to, made it hard to, uh, how, do you say, how do you say it, um, to go forth with plans and execute on the tactics and things like that. Now the DBFT algorithm acknowledges two types of entities on the blockchain, and the first one is a professional node operator who uses. Um, running a node as a source of income and these are called bookkeeping nodes and the second one is just users who are interested in accessing the features of the blockchain. Accordingly, block verification is held through a game, I guess you could call it, of consensus between bookkeeping nodes by which they are appointed from the ordinary nodes, so the users, uh, through a form of delegated voting. And what happens is, in every verification round, one of the uh, bookkeeping nodes will be pseudo-randomly selected. And for those who don't know, pseudo-randomness is a method of randomness which seems random but is not actually random in short terms. And so basically, they will be pseudo-randomly selected to uh, broadcast their truth or their version of the blockchain to the rest of the network. And if a minimum of two-thirds of the remaining nodes and the votes agree, this version of the blockchain will be published. And the consensus is secured and the blockchain will continue on to the next block. But if less than, if less than two-thirds of the network uh, agrees, a different node will be appointed to broadcast its version of the, um, the blockchain and this will continue if the node um, is not, vo its blockchain version is not voted in, this will continue and continue and continue until consensus is reached. This method makes attacks nearly impossible to execute unless the two thirds or the majority of the system um, want to execute financial suicide. The version, uh, the system is also fork proof because at any given moment you only have one version of the blockchain existing. And without complex algorithms to solve, the nodes run much faster than other things like uh, proof of work nodes, which are able to compete with centralized, uh, which allow uh, NEO and its blockchain to compete with uh, centralized payment methods such as um, 
Visa and PayPal and things like that due to a higher level of scalability. And they have a current transaction rate of about a thousand transactions per second with a goal of gaining about 10,000 transactions per second. There are currently only a few bookkeepers in use, but they have been voted in and there will be more added in the future as the platform develops and the network becomes more used. See, this is one of the big criticisms of NEO which people have often is they look at that and go, oh, well, it's centralized and all that stuff. But the reality is, it doesn't necessarily need to be fully decentralized yet because it's not even really um, being used and it, you don't really need that full decentralization until people start to really adopt it. So how does it work? Another thing I want to talk about is tokens and there are two tokens on the NEO platform and the first one is NEO and NEO is basically representative of shares in the NEO market and they cannot be divided. So if you say you buy 1.5 NEO and you want to send, you try to send that 1.5 NEO to your wallet, you will only have one NEO show up in your wallet because it only works in whole integers. So you will lose that 0.5 NEO. So your best when you're buying it to buy whole, um, whole numbers of NEO. And it is used in block creation, network management, network changes and other consensus things. Like I said before, the 50 million were sold during an ICO and the holders gain rights to vote in the NEO ecosystem. So that's what I was talking about with the DBFT algorithm. Those who hold NEO have the right to vote for the versions of the blockchain. And they also, when you hold NEO, you can stake your NEO and get a dividend in the form of gas, which is a token I'll talk about in a second. The other 50 million, 10 million were set aside to reward developers and um, the NEO council. 10 million to stimulate the development ecosystem, 15 million to be retained as a contingency, and then 15 million to be, re to be invested in blockchain ecosystems supporting NEO. Gas. Gas is the fuel for the NEO network, just like Ethereum. So if, you feel, if you're familiar with Ethereum gas, gas on NEO is the same thing just on the NEO platform. It is to be paid uh, when you're making a transaction, and it has also a max supply of 100 million just like the NEO token. And you might be wondering, when I was talking about DBFT before, when in proof of work and other things like that, the miners have an incentive to mine because they get a block reward. And if 50 million were distributed in ICO and the other 50 million are held in other places, well, what's the financial incentive for bookkeeping nodes? Well, gas is their financial incentive because when you get a block, you receive a block reward in the form of eight gas currently. And unlike NEO, gas is, all, is divisible to 100 million, which is the same as what Bitcoin is divisible by. So some use cases. Uh, the first one is digital assets. And this is aiming to digitize physical assets and store them as electronic data. And what it does, it aims to make the digitization decentralized, transparent, trustful, and traceable all at the same time. This way, users will be able to rec uh, register, circulate, and trade their own assets. And these assets will be uh, connected through a digital identity, which is something I'll talk about in a second. And those with an identity would be protected by law. That's also another big thing, the whole thing of law and regulation with NEO. So NEO has two forms of digital assets on its blockchain. The first one is global assets, and these are assets recorded in the system space, which can be identified by all smart contracts and clients. So it can be identified by anyone. And then there are contract assets, which are recorded in a private storage area of a smart contract and require a compatible client to recognize them. So they're private um, assets. The smart economy. Now, NEO is similar to Ethereum in that it allows the storage and exchange of digital assets, in concept that is. However, NEO takes advantage of evolving tech, uh, technology and cooperation with Chinese authorities, like government authorities, mostly China, but they will be looking to go expand further out in towards Asia and the wider region in the future. And they want to create this goal of the smart economy. And basically, this is like an economy using the blockchain, using the NEO platform and working with authorities. And what this does, when you work with authorities, you really help to progress your platform and you make sure that it is valid and that you don't run in, into any uh, speed bumps, I guess. 
And digital identities, that's something that I mentioned before. These will, NEO will enable the creation of an identity um, of organizations, individuals, and entities in an electronic form. And these identities will be used by, usable by multi, multi-factor authentication mechanisms. So just things like facial recognition, fingerprints, voice recognition, SMS, and a ton of other methods. So they're nice and secure. Smart contracts. Now, NEO has a highly decentralized, reliable, independent, and tamper-resistant smart contract system, and they're called NEO contracts. Now, unlike Ethereum, where programmers need to learn its own coding language called Solidity, NEO is compatible with basically all common languages like C, C Sharp, C++, Java, and Python. And NEO's lightweight virtual, virtual machine has the advantage of high certainty which is of acquisition of assets and transfers, and then high concurrency and high scalability for smart contracts. Neo contracts. Now the feet these like so Neo contracts are smart contracts, but they have a couple of different features built into them. And the first one is timestamps. So if someone wants to automate regular payments, say every week, Neo will register a timestamp to every new block that is created. And this will allow the smart contract to know exactly what time it is every timestamp to ensure that it stays up to date and the smart contract stays valid. The second one is data storage. So data within the smart contract can be stored privately, accessible to only the contracting client which it was associated, just like I was talking about with the assets before, or it can be stored as a global asset accessed by all smart contracts on the network. However, external data from um, other sources and other platforms must be transferred onto the NEO blockchain and passed onto these public or private data stores before uh, they can be referenced by a smart contract. So some use cases for NEO. Um, first one is dApps, or well, some more use cases I'd say. Um, dApps can be built on the core code um, over the NEO platform and this supports by, the, the NEO uh, community supports this by providing up-to-date development tools. And then there's a bunch of potential areas to create dApps here. I'm not going to read them out because I don't want to make this video too long, but you can pause the video and see for yourself. Some features of NEO. The first one is superconducting transactions. And in a centralized exchange, what happens is orders are placed and then they're matched. And this is efficient, but it requires the users to release their funds to a centralized body. And by automating the matching and placement across the consensus network, it creates a, dense, a decentralized exchange, but this is inefficient as adjustments must be validated across the network. And so NEO is trying to sort of blend this together to get the best of both worlds. And they propose a system where their transactions are settled on chain, but automating order matching is handled off chain by a central exchange. So it's just the order matching. It's not you're not releasing your funds to them or anything. That's still off. That's still on chain and decentralized. And this gives the efficiency of the centralized exchange with the security of the decentralized exchange. NEOX. Now, NEOX is a protocol which allows for transactions across blockchains. And it consists of two parts. The first one is cross-chain assets exchange. This will allow atomic swaps where multiple participants exchange assets across different chains to ensure that all steps in the transaction uh, either succeed or fail together. And this uses NEO smart contracts to create a contract account for each participant. If the blockchains are not compatible with NEO smart contracts, they can still if they can still be compatible with NEOX as long as they provide simple smart contract functionality. Uh, NEOX continued um, cross-chain distributed transactions is the second. This means that multiple steps of a transaction are scattered across a blockchain or scattered across blockchains, I'm sorry, and that the consistency as, as a whole is secure. This means that smart contracts can be performed using different functions on different chains, either succeeding or failing as a whole still. NeoFS. This allows large filed and uh, this, sorry, that should say files, not fold. Large files to be divided and distributed across the network. Uh, this is to reduce bottlenecks and improve efficiency. 
and then users can select the reliability of what of they expect of what they expect of that file. So files of low re reliability requirements can be stored at a minimal cost, and then for a higher fee, data can be stored on more reliable nodes. So a more reliable node is that higher security. And NeoQS, and this is something which will not. This is probably more down the road. Um, this is using lattice-based cryptography, which is theoretically resistant to quantum attacks. So, but that's like quantum computing still not out yet. So we don't really need to worry about that for at least half a decade to a decade. So where do you buy and store Neo? Well, let's take a look, shall we? We can see here the main place you buy Neo. We got most uh, like a third of the volume coming out of Bittrex and then slightly under coming out of Binance and then Bitfinex coming um, close behind it. And then we do have sort of these smaller exchanges, but most people do have Bittrex, Binance or Bitfinex. Um, so you should be able to get Neo. And there's also been rumors of Neo uh, coming to other exchanges. I won't say what, but I'm not going to spread that because I don't want to sort of spread fake news. And in terms of storing your Neo, you store it, the, well, sort of, you can store it on a couple of different places. You've got the official Neo wallet, and then you've got the Neon wallet. Like, so these are both desktop clients, and the Neon wallet is an official wallet, but it is built by the city of Zion. And for those who don't know, the city of Zion is an, uh, um, open or is a uh, source, oh, I'm sorry, is a community of uh, developers who work to make the Neo ecosystem better and improve it. And they've created a wallet which now has Ledger Nano S support, which is also very good because it allows hardware wallets to be compatible with Neo. You've also got various web wallets, the Neo client and then paper wallets, but yeah. The community and the team behind Neo, well, the community, I mean, the team first, they do have, they have a moderate sized team. It's not huge, but it's not tiny. I think it's about 20 people now. They've just recently hired a couple of new people, but they're, the head of their team, um, he's sort of like the one who's really active, Da Hong Fei. Um, he really promotes Neo, and I think he's a really good uh, leader of the team. But in terms of the other developers, they have had some good experience in other, not only blockchain uh, companies, but also bigger companies as well. And they also bring out regular updates and things like that. But up until now, the one bad thing about their team has been that they've been sort of trying to hype with news and announcements and things like that. But they did release a statement, uh, I think it would have been about two weeks ago now, saying that they're going to try and refrain from this. So hopefully they can do it because it really um, was making a lot of people angry uh, because of the volatility and sort of letdowns that they were providing. Now, in terms of the community, you've got quite a few options and the community has had very substantial growth over the past couple of weeks. You've got the Neo blog, first of all, with discussion. You've got only 12K followers on Facebook, but I mean, Facebook's not really the biggest thing for cryptocurrency. On Twitter, they have 151,000 followers, which is a good one. A good number, I should say, plus the team members' Twitters, like Da Hong Fei. And on the Twitter, they give regular updates, so like a monthly update, blog, and things like that. On Reddit, they have 45,000 readers currently, and I want to highlight that with the, the Reddit and Twitter numbers, these have gone up a lot over the last month. This has probably gone up about 10,000, I think this has probably gone about 40,000 over the past month. And then you've got other Chinese social media platforms. So the future of NEO, um, what they've got upcoming, they've got the NEO and Microsoft Development Comp, uh, which they announced a couple of weeks ago, which is happening in January. Not long after, I think it's in March, they're having the NEO DevCon Developer Conference. Then they have, um, they're have they looking to release NEX, which is a decentralized trade and payment service, which is created and advised by the members of the NEO Council and the City of Zion. They have a couple of upcoming ICOs. They have Red Pulse and Aphelion, but since uh, the whole China ICO ban, it's been really hard to do that. 
Um, and also Neo has this is sort of the most recent news. Neo has now partnered with Coinfern, which is a reg tech. Reg tech. I don't even know how you'd say it. I think it'd be reg tech, because it means regulatory tech company. And what these companies do is they work with financial institutions and governing bodies in order to uh, aid in the regulatory process uh, concerning new technologies such as blockchain. And they've also partnered with QRC, which is a reg tech and venture platform company. So these guys are really looking to um, discuss and bring up good solid regulation in China with the Chinese government and the governing bodies. So my thoughts with NEO, it has really big potential due to China's huge economy and population. Um, like China is sort of a powerhouse of everything, whether it be technology and econ or economy. Um, the government support and collaboration, that will be a big thing because once you have government support and collaboration, you can really know where you need to go without having any sort of things coming, uh, sort of regulatory things coming in your way. And it also gives you a really good backing and not only from the government, but even, I mean, it's not like the people necessarily trust the government, but um, you know what I mean. I hope you do anyway. So Chinese independency, this is, what I mean by this is, for those who don't know, um, China is sort of like weird in that it uses different, even though it'll have technologies, it'll use quite often, I'm not saying it's all the, all the time and it, that it doesn't use things that we do, but it's quite often you find that China uses things like, say, for example, social media platforms. China will use different ones than we do and they will have different things different technologies and platforms that that are used then that are used in the western world like say we would here use in australia or america or the uk or something like that and neo also it has a good technology foundation and a lot of use cases because it's covering such a whole broad topic uh broad niche i should say not topic it's vast coding languages allow for fre uh, fle flexibility, flexibility um, of development and allow more developers to come in and use the platform. It has good scalability and it has good smart contract robustness and flexibility as well. So to cap it off, we'll just do a bit of TA at the moment, for the moment. And I've got here, this is the dollar chart, yep. So we can see here around June, July, this was about currently here was about where the rebranding took place to Neo, and we saw here that it just shot up like into this into the moon and once the China FUD came out it just really just crashed down to yeah nearly twelve dollars, thirteen dollars. And since then we've sort of come up settled around this sort of twenty five to thirty dollar mark and then we've even gone up a slightly bit more and settled around this thirty five dollar mark. And recently we have had the partnership announcements with Neo, so we have seen a bit of a run up. However, it is slightly, it's slightly pulling back, but at the moment we can't really do much technical analysis on it because there's just nothing, no consistent evidence for uh, any reversals or trends or uh, continuation patterns and things like that. However, we are getting good volume um, and our RSI is cooling off a bit. I think it might cool off a bit a bit more and the MACD is pinching up here, which we might see a slight decline in that as well. In terms of USD dollar price, I think NEO will be something that will slowly go up um, over the next couple of months, depending on what happens fundamentally with news and things like that. But the thing we're really gonna have to look for is uh, the release of regulations and trading cryptocurrencies in China, because China is really you're missing the biggest part of this whole investment community I should say in China so once that comes out we're gonna see a really big boom in NEO but until then I think it's just gonna be slowly but surely uh, going up and down and sort of slowly climbing now in terms of the BTC price we see a bit of a different story here up until about here up until about October it looks pretty much the same as the US dollar price but we have been on this sort of down slope back to a full retracement from the rebranding 
Uh, this is due to the fact that NEO has been standing still in terms of price and Bitcoin has just been rocketing up. But I think we have just bounced around this full retracement fib line here and I think we're, we're probably maybe dip a little bit lower but at this time it's pretty hard to tell it really for neo it's something that's quite based on a lot of uh it's been quite based on a lot of news and fundamentals so we're just gonna have to wait and see we do see the rsi cooling off and the macd pinching there but it doesn't really tell us that much so i'm waiting for neo to go down i do have quite a bit of neo um, I'm not buying any at the moment, certainly, but as it goes down, it, as it if it does go down, I will buy it at a discount and slowly dollar, dollar cost average it. I want to thank you for watching this video. If you liked this video or found it helpful, please leave a thumbs up and a comment below and make sure to hit that subscribe button as I'll be bringing out future videos and other cryptos very soon. I'll catch you later.